Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions. And question number one is from Dean Lockhart. Thank you. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to lower outpatient waiting times. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. We've seen a significant growth in outpatient numbers with over 140,000 extra patients now being seen on an annual basis compared to 2009. I announced last week that £10 million has been made available to health boards to reduce long waits for a first outpatient appointment. This funding will provide an additional 40,000 outpatient appointments between now and the end of March. Yesterday, I also announced a consultative document to transform out outpatients. The aim is to deliver a major shift in the way outpatient care is delivered. The modern outpatient, a collaborative approach, sets a new strategy for managing the rising demand in outpatient appointments and aims to free up around 400,000 hospital appointments. It will also enable people to get seen by the most appropriate health professional and often closer to home, ending many repeated and unnecessary trips to hospital. Dean Lockhart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Further funding is, of course, welcome. However, as we have said on this side of the Chamber a number of times, it's not just about the money spent, it's about having the necessary staffing resources available to deliver satisfactory outcomes for patients. Across Scotland, there are high vacancy rates in cardiology, and this is particularly the case in NHS Forth Valley, where the vacancy rate for card cardiology consultants is above the national average and is currently standing at 16.7%. This is having a direct effect on patient outcomes. In NHS Forth Valley, despite the hard work of the local staff, the longest reported wait to see a cardiologist was 202 days. This is nearly 29 weeks and is more than double the Scottish Government target of 12 weeks. Can I therefore ask what the Cabinet Secretary is doing to urgently resolve high cardiology consultant vacancy rates across Scotland and in NHS Forth Valley and uh, to address these unacceptable waiting times for patients? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I say to the, the member that in taking forward the outpatient plan in, in particular, what we will have to ensure is that there are a range of health professionals, particularly in uh, working in the community, and obviously we have the £500 million investment in primary care to ensure that we have the right professionals in the right places to help ensure that we manage the outpatient process much more effectively. Now, in terms of consultants, and obviously the consultant as a specialist will remain very important in that uh, process, and I can tell the member that uh, certainly uh, the, the number uh, of uh, consultants, medical uh, and dental consultants, is up 40% uh, uh, over uh, the last, since uh, September 2006 to June 2016. So we have seen more consultants, more specialists. There are, though, particular specialties where there are shortages. Cardiology is one of those challenges. What I am happy to do, given the member has raised specific issues about cardiologists in Forth Valley, is to write to him with more specific information about what action is being taken to address uh, those, those local issues. Marie Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the Scottish Government investment in reducing outpatient waiting times. Over the winter period, demand for NHS services is expected to increase. What support has been given to NHS boards over the winter to ensure that required capacity is in place to manage the expected increase in demand? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I can tell Marie Todd that um, I announced last week an additional £3 million uh, which is being allocated to local boards to help support their preparations for winter. Uh, this uh, £3 million uh, of winter funding is designed to increase each uh, local area's winter resilience. That's in addition to previously announced sums of money, including £9 million to support accident and emergency departments over winter and £30 million specifically to reduce delayed discharges this year. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, but, Cabinet Secretary, patient treatment following GP referrals at NHS Ayrshire are now the worst in Scotland and have been falling from acceptable levels to unacceptable levels for the last 18 months. And I have been aware of this from the growing number of my constituents who have contacted me because they are unable to get hospital appointments with winter pressure still to come. I have raised these matters of unmet demand in different ways with the Cabinet Secretary over several years, and she has reasonably acknowledged this growing problem, and I welcome her promise of extra funding. 
However, Cabinet Secretary, hand-wringing over these statistics of misery and disappointment, which have a bearing on outcomes, is no longer enough, notwithstanding the daily more frantic efforts of frontline staff to get through the work. What instructions or funding are you going to give directly to NHS Ayrshire and Arne to encourage or force them to up their game? Cabinet Secretary. I certainly would acknowledge John Scott has regularly uh, raised uh, local issues regarding uh, Ayrshire and Arne's uh, performance. Uh, what I can say to John Scott is that, of course, Ayrshire and Arne will get a share of the £10 million to improve outpatient performance, and that is important in the short term, creating those additional 40,000 outpatient appointments between now and March across uh, Scotland. However, there is a more fundamental issue here, and that is, at the moment, the way our outpatient system works is that everybody ends up in the same queue to see a specialist, even if actually they would be better treated by someone else. So if you look at uh, orthopaedics, for example, a lot of work has been done to make sure that those who were traditionally in the queue to see an orthopaedic consultant, many are now seen by physiotherapists because that's actually the best health professional to see them. Now, what we need to make sure is that through this reform of outpatients, whether that's in Ayrshire and Arran or anywhere else in Scotland, that we get people into the, to the right professional, which will mean those who do need to see a specialist will be able to see them far more quickly. Again, I'm happy to write to John Scott with more detail about the allocation uh, of the £10 million that will go to Ayrshire and Iron. Thank you. I would just encourage both members and the Minister shorter questions, please, and shortest answers. We'll get through more. Number two, Pauline McNeill. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government how long it will take to make a decision on the future of Lightburn Hospital if this was to come to Ministers. Cabinet Secretary. As the member knows, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde's proposals around Lightburn Hospital may well change or indeed not be taken forward at all as a result of the public engagement process currently underway. This is part of the well-established process on service change in the NHS and why I cannot and will not prejudge the outcome. The time taken to carefully consider any major service change proposal is largely dependent on the nature, context and complexity of those proposals. If these proposals are designated major and come to me, I will take sufficient time to carefully consider all of the available evidence and representations. Pauline McNeill. Former MSP Paul Martin highlighted in January of this year that there was a plan to close Lightburn Hospital by referring to a health board minute in which it stated that Lightburn Hospital was up for closure, for which he was called a liar. In April, local M MP Anne McLaughlin wrote to constituents saying that she has received an unequivocal assurance that Lightburn will not close. Given that, uh, that's an assurance I don't think anyone can give, given what the Minister has said. So she's deliberating on the matter. So I'd be like to know where Anne McLaughlin got that assurance from. But is the Minister concerned that the service is clearly being run down? while that decision is being taken. And will she accept an appeal from me that the people of Glasgow North East do need a third hospital to serve older people? If she's considering an option to reduce the service by closing Lightburn Hospital and transferring beds to Stop Hill and Glasgow Royal, it will not be an adequate solution for the people of North East Glasgow. Cabinet Secretary. Well, what I would say to Polly McNeill and stress is that nothing has come to me. Uh, I will have to wait until Greater Glasgow and Clyde have taken through their proper public engagement process. That may or may not result in any formal change proposal. But what I would want to see and to make sure if anything did come to me and I was uh, considering that as a major service change proposal is that I would need to be convinced that it addressed some of those concerns that Pauline McNeill and others have raised, that it would be fully consistent with national policy and indeed would improve the patient experience. So I would expect any proposal, if they were to come to me, to address all of those issues. And I would hope that Polly McNeill and others would uh, certainly fully uh, partake in any consultation around those. Ivan McKee. Yeah, uh, the Scottish Government's national clinical strategy calls for a shift to community-based services and to person-centred care in homely settings. For example, a local community-based hospital in familiar surroundings, and it calls for uh, to address health inequalities by moving resources into areas of high deprivation, not away from them. 
Can the Cabinet Secretary reiterate our support for those principles and that any proposal for changes to health services in the east end of Glasgow, and including local community hospitals such as Lightburn, would have to be consistent with those principles? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, obviously what I can say is that when uh, that Nicola Sturgeon rejected proposals to close Lightburn Hospital as health secretary in 2011 because she had consistently heard from both patients and clinicians that the hospital provided high quality services and were greatly valued. Uh, but as I said to Polly McNeill, I would need to be convinced that any final proposals, if they do indeed emerge, effectively address concerns raised by Ivan McKee and others, that, that any proposals are fully consistent with national policy and, importantly, would improve the patient experience. That is a challenge to Greater Glasgow and Clyde when looking at the, the future of Lightburn Hospital. But as I stress, nothing has come to me at the moment. It is a very early stage of the process and I would expect Greater Glasgow and Clyde to take on board uh, the, the need for them to address all of those issues. Anna Sarwar. Thank you, President Officer. Let's be clear, days before the election, Paul Martin was called a liar for suggesting that there were plans to close Lightburn Hospital. An SNP MP used parliamentary resources to write to every constituent to say that she got assurances from this Cabinet Secretary that there were no plans to close Lightburn Hospital. It seems the Cabinet Secretary is denying that that was the case. And now six months later, those proposals are in black and white. And that same MP, as well as the local SNP MSP, is now holding public meetings in the area, claiming that they're the ones that will try and save Lightburn Hospital. This is a betrayal of people in the East End of Glasgow. And the Cabinet Secretary should be honest with Parliament today and say that those proposals are real and that she will accept the will of this Parliament to call those proposals in. And we believe that those proposals should be to reject the closure of Lightburn Hospital. Cabinet Secretary. Oh, I'm surprised that Anna Sarwar is criticising MPs or MSPs for listening to their constituents and I would expect any MPs or MSPs to listen to the views of their local constituents, whether it's on the future of Lightburn Hospital or any other issue. As I have said now in response to two questions, there is no formal proposals. What there is is a consultation uh, pr public engagement process currently underway. That's at a very early stage. Proposals may or may not emerge from that. Nothing has come to me in terms of formal service change proposals. But if, if they do, I have set out very clearly the criteria that would need to be met in those proposals. It would need to improve the patient experience. It would need to be fully consistent with national policy. And it would need to address those local concerns that have been raised. I don't think I could be clearer. Thank you. Just uh, to this opportunity to remind members, just be careful about the language they use in the chamber. Uh, and also, I would urge all questioners yet again to be briefer in their questions. Uh, question number three, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the NHS Ayrshire and Arran and what matters were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. Ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Ayrshire and Arran, to discuss matters of importance to local people. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? As part of the independent review announced last week into the baby deaths at Cross House Hospital, could I ask that the parents of baby Elijah Kennedy, who died in 2011, and Joseph Campbell, who died in 2012, could I ask that both their sets of parents be included in that review so that their story may be heard and that any lessons will be learned and acted upon? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would certainly, first of all, just uh, wish to put on record you know, my condolences to any family who, who lose uh, a, a baby. Um, and I think we would all want to uh, make sure that in taking forward the, the review that Healthcare Improvement Scotland have been asked to carry out, that the views of families are very much at the centre of that. Now, I have asked uh, his to look uh, into whether the processes and procedures within Ayr were properly followed in uh, the cases that have been highlighted. I have asked that his meet with the affected families as part of this review and that his then report back to me with their findings at the earliest uh, opportunity. Um, I will certainly ask his to make contact with the families raised 
here by Willie Coffey, but I would expect uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland to meet with any families who would wish uh, to discuss their concerns uh, with Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and that's the indication I've given to them in taking forward this very important review. Jamie Green. Uh, Presiding Officer, um, NHS Ayrshire and Iron has unfortunately been in the news an awful lot recently. We've heard numerous reports of understaffing, lengthy waiting times and unfillable vacancies. A case of a 19-month wait to see a consultant, which was only resolved after we brought it up with the First Minister in this chamber. And of course, the tragic cases of avoidable stillbirth deaths at Crosshouse Hospital. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what steps she is planning to take to restore public trust and confidence, not just in NHS Ayrshire and Arran, but across the entire Scottish Health Service? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the member raises a number of issues, but first of all, let me, me deal with the issue of uh, maternity and neonatal care, because I think it's very important to stress that uh, despite some of the, the very serious issues that have been raised about Ayrshire and Arran, Ayrshire and Arran, along with all the other maternity and neonatal units, have seen uh, a, a really marked improvement uh, in the number of, of stillbirths. So stillbirths are down in 2015, the lowest on record, and indeed neonatal deaths and maternal deaths are also down. And I think it's important that we give that public reassurance that despite some of those uh, those very real issues that Healthcare Improvement Scotland have been asked to look into. Overall, the units are safer now than they were previously, and I think those figures are something that we should, we should welcome. However, the member raises issues around the, the general performance of Ayrshire and Arran, issues that have were raised, raised previously by John Scott around uh, scheduled care performance. I'm very clear... Uh, with Ayrshire and Iron, as I would be with any other board, that we expect through their share of the £10 million to see marked improvement in outpa outpatient performance and indeed in scheduled care performance. We also expect uh, improvements in the performance of A&E at Air Hospital. We have seen significant improvement at Crosshouse Hospital in the A&E department performance there. So there is improvement in performance in some areas in Ayrshire and Arran, but there's still room for improvement in others. Again, I'm happy to write to the member with more details if you'd find that helpful. Question number four, Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with NHS Lanarkshire regarding the implementation of the mental health strategy. Minister Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. During the implementation of the previous mental health strategy 2012-2015, implementation review visits by Scottish Government officials to NHS Lanarkshire took place in May and November 2012, May and November 2013, May and November 2014 and May 2015. In the engagement process for the forthcoming 10-year mental health strategy, the Scottish Government received a written response to its engagement paper, Mental Health in Scotland, a 10-year vision, from the Lanarkshire Planning Partnerships North and South. This written response was the result of a collaboration between North and South Lanarkshire Health and Social Care Partnerships, NHS Lanarkshire, North and South Lanarkshire Councils, and the local voluntary sector. The Scottish Government has carefully considered this response, along with the other, the other 597 responses that were received in developing the final strategy. Christina McKelvey. Can I thank the Minister for, for all that information? And the Minister will know the value of working closely with community-based organisations, along with the NHS and other organisations. And can I draw our attention to the work of an organisation in my constituency called FAMS, Families and Friends Affected by Murder and Suicide? And can I ask the Minister if she will ensure that organisations like FAMS will be invited to contribute and work with NHS Lanarkshire to, to roll out the mental health strategy in my local area? Minister. Well, I think uh, organisations like uh, FAMS in the members' constituency absolutely have a key role to play, and the prevention and reduction of suicides in Scotland is a key priority area for the Scottish Government, and engagement in developing the next suicide prevention strategy will take place in spring 2017. And during this period, we would expect input uh, to this important area from a range of agencies, including the organisations like Families and Friends Affected by Murder and Suicide. 
and it is the role of NHS boards to draw on the knowledge, ability and resources of local groups like those to develop solutions that reflect the needs of their population. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The draft uh, mental health strategy, the 10-year strategy, states that there will be actions to improve perinatal mental health. NHS Lanarkshire Perinatal Mental Health Services didn't begin until November 2014, and NHS Lanarkshire does not have inpatient specialist perinatal mental health services, instead relies on NHS Glasgow, Greater Glasgow and Clyde. I uh, note from the previous reply that the Minister perhaps hasn't met NHS Lanarkshire recently, but is this something that her officials have discussed or that she might discuss in the near future? And does she find that situation to be acceptable? Minister. Well, of course, it is up to NHS boards to decide how best to provide that services and cooperation across health boards is absolutely vital in taking forward um, health in Scotland in the future. Um, in terms of perinatal mental health specifically, um, the mental health strategy will dovetail with the review that um, Jane Grant from Forth Valley has been undertaking into um, uh, neonatal and maternal health services. Question number five, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the establishment of a respiratory task force to help tackle lung disease in Scotland. Thank you. Uh, we are already working closely with the National Advisory Group to support local improvement in respiratory care through the development of Respiratory Health Quality Improvement Plan. The plan will aim to support NHS boards and respiratory managed clinical networks in making local improvements in respiratory diagnosis, treatment and care. Emma Harper. Thank you for that answer. Does the Minister agree that charities such as Chest Heart Stroke Scotland, British Lung Foundation and Asthma UK are doing important work around lung health in Scotland and will she maintain regular contact with, stage, with these stakeholders to engage with their recommendations for how to best deal with lung disease? Minister. Um, you know, ab absolutely. We absolutely recognise the uh, valuable contribution that our third sector partners play in supporting people living with respiratory conditions. Uh, to offer a couple of examples, uh, we have supported the development with £160,000 worth of funding resources such as My Lungs, My Life, the online resource that was developed by Chest Heart Stroke Scotland, which helps people to understand and self-manage their condition. And we've also recently approved funding of £112,000 to CHSS to support the development of an online uh, learning resource um, to support professionals through e-learning. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, although we've seen a, a welcome decrease in the proportion of people smoking, not least as a result of the, the ban on smoking in public places introduced by Labour in 2006, the rate of declining is much slower in the most deprived areas and it's not expected to reach the government's 2034 target, despite the fact that 60% of those accessing smoking cessation services live in the most deprived areas. Now, given that COPD is the, the only major rising cause of death in Scotland and is much more prevalent in socially deprived areas, does the Minister believe that developing an action plan to tackle the slow pace of decline in smoking in the most deprived areas should be a priority for the Government? Minister. Well, we absolutely, and I think we probably share, regardless of the party, we understand that inequalities exacerbate some of the public health challenges that we face as a country. And, you know, that's to be congratulated that the Labour Party took forward that groundbreaking piece of legislation. And, you know, I think in the spirit of that cross-party uh, cooperation, it should be recognised that we have taken forward other bits of that uh, bit of work to try and stop some of these uh, Poor uh, choices around smoking or alcohol or um, drug dependency uh, impacting most heavily on our uh, most deprived communities. So I think we should work together to try and tackle some of those things. We have a, ta a tobacco strategy sets out some of the areas in which we want to make uh, more progress. And of course, the member will also recognise that uh, I think next week we'll vote to um, see the uh, legislation come forward around uh, smoking in cars with children. So that work goes on across the different political parties to make sure that we can make the differences. But yet, like the member, sometimes we're always imp impatient for change to make sure that our, everybody has a fair chance to flourish, that our most deprived areas get the chance to have better uh, health outcomes. And I hope that that uh, spirit of consensus, we can probably try and work across the political parties to try and make the differences that I think we all probably want to seek. 
Donald Cameron. Um, I note what the Minister said in terms of the diagnosis and treatment of uh, lung disease. And the Minister may be aware of the British Lung Foundation's Battle for Breath report, which looks at the impact of uh, lung disease across the, the UK. And the report states that more can be done to improve awareness, availability of screening and prevention in particular. What is the Scottish Government doing to improve in these areas? Minister. We, are, we know that, the, that there is a, a number of recommendations set out for the battle of breath uh, and we certainly will take on board the, the recommendations that we, we met, we, they set out and we'll continue to work hard to ensure that diagnosis is better. I've outlined some of the ways in which we have funded our third sector partners in order to try and help and allow people to cope much, most better with their, much better with their uh, condition. And we'll certainly look at all ideas, all uh, recommendations to ensure that that can be uh, improved uh, across the piece. Question number six, Morris Golden. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it carries out to ascertain which groups are most vulnerable to seasonal health risks. Cabinet Secretary Sean Robson. The Scottish Government relies on analysis provided by a range of experts and specialist advisory committees on seasonal risk to health. The sources of these analysis will vary depending on the specific issue concerned, as seasonal health risks are an issue relevant to a wide range of health matters. For example, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation provides advice on which groups should receive the seasonal flu vaccine. And Health Protection Scotland provides the government with analysis on an ongoing basis about threats to health, such as infectious diseases, which may have a seasonal trend to them. Morris Golden. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. The Scottish Government's own figures show that last year almost 3,000 of our fellow Scots died during winter, above and beyond the average rate for the rest of the year. This figure is completely unacceptable. World Health Organisation research suggests that around one third of these 3,000 deaths could be attributed to cold homes. In our manifesto, my party commits to improving all properties in Scotland to at least an EPC Ban C rating. This would improve energy efficiency, tackle fuel poverty and make homes easier to heat. The National Institute of Health and Care Excellence makes the same recommendation. Will the Scottish Government help to tackle these needless deaths by committing to a similar goal and set out a plan of action on how this can be achieved? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, first of all, can, can I say that um, there is a, a lot of analysis done on deaths during winter to look at trends and to look at previous years and whether there's anything uh, emerging from those trends that we should uh, look at in particular. So that is an ongoing process. And the member makes an important point that uh, actually issues of fuel poverty are uh, very, very critical uh, in this, uh, in preventing um, deaths from, uh, from, from cold homes. So it's not just the health service response that uh, is required here, it's a cross government uh, response. And of course, we will look at uh, um, ideas from across this chamber, although what I would point out is that fuel poverty uh, measures have been uh, taken forward by this government for a number of years now uh, that are important in lifting people out of fuel poverty, but it is very, very challenging. The only point I would make is that the situation is not helped by some of the welfare reforms that have been introduced by the UK government, which has put pressure on uh, family budgets, particularly those on low incomes, that does nothing uh, to help uh, address fuel poverty and, in fact, can make the situation much, much worse. Question number seven, Morris, uh, sorry, Finlay Carson. Ask the Scottish Government how many GPs have been recruited in Dumfries and Galloway through the bursary initiative and how many posts remain vacant. Cabinet Secretary. Of, of six GP specialty training posts which are eligible for the bursary in the Dumfries and Galloway region, three posts were initially filled, but one individual has since declined their job offer. This leaves four vacancies which will be advertised in the forthcoming 2017 recruitment rounds. Finlay Carson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. In Galloway and West Dumfries, rural GP practices are in crisis. GPs are working longer hours than ever. Practices are being forced to merge and there's a fear in local communities that some practices will close. 
Will the Cabinet Secretary meet with me to discuss the possibility of giving the Galloway Community Hospital in Stranraer training hospital status and explore the possibility of seconding armed forces doctors to ensure vital GP services can be delivered in rural areas? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I'm certainly happy to, to meet with the, the, the member to discuss um, any of, of these uh, ideas. I'm always looking and uh, ha happy to, to speak to members about ideas coming from across this chamber. Uh, obviously, we would have to look at whether those uh, ideas were, were practical and deliverable, but certainly I'm willing to, uh, to meet with the member to discuss them further. What I would point out, though, is that we have a huge amount of work underway to uh, improve the position within primary care, a £500 million investment over the course of this parliament, some short-term uh, measures to stabilise the position um, and address recruitment and retention issues, particularly in rural areas. Uh, and again, I'm happy to furnish the member with more detail of that, but we'd be happy to meet with him to discuss the issues he raises. Question number eight, Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its assessment is of health services in the Murray area. Minister, sorry, Cabinet Secretary. Health services uh, across the Grampian are assessed at a board level. The NHS Grampian Annual Review took place on the 6th of October. This process ensures the rigorous scrutiny of the board's performance whilst encouraging as much direct dialogue and accountability between local communities and NHS Grampian as possible. I've issued a letter to the board. It contains my observations on the board's performance in relation to a range of issues details a number of initiatives and actions to be taken forward over the coming months. The letter shall be posted on NHS Grampians website in the near future. Douglas Ross. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I have a constituent from Murray who's been treated for breast cancer at Rig Moor, but because she lives within NHS Grampian, she faces significant challenges with her treatment. For example, she can't have her bloods taken at the Oaks in Elgin, an excellent facility which would save her going into a GP waiting area with her low immune system because the Oaks don't send samples to NHS Highland, only to NHS Grampian. She also had an NHS Highland prescription for a wig, but the hairdresser closer, closest to her home in Elgin could not deal with that because she didn't have an NHS Grampian prescription. What can the Scottish Government do to improve the service of care for patients within the Murray area who face similar problems because they choose to be treated closer to home at Moor rather than within the NHS Grampian area? Cabinet Secretary. I think the member raises some very important issues here. I would be happy to look into the specifics. It sounds as if there are boundary issues here potentially getting in the way of some sensible uh, solutions that would make it easier for the, the patient that you're referring to. What would help me is if you were to write to me with further detail and I can follow that up and respond to the member uh, on the, the important issues that he raises. Richard Lockhead. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that one of the reasons for some of the pressures in Murray Health Service is attracting health professionals to come and live in our more rural areas and the case of consultants to work at some of our smaller hospitals in Scotland. Would the Cabinet Secretary be, be willing to look at the extent to which incentives are available to attract health professionals to work in such areas, uh, as I think this is something that could make a real difference to helping address some of the pressures? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there have already been a, a number of incentives uh, to encourage uh, those uh, health professionals to go and work, in, particularly in rural uh, communities. We have, uh, for example, bursaries and golden hellos available in particular specialties to attract, try to attract them to harder to fill uh, posts. Um, we have also the regional and workforce plans that are uh, in the process of being developed, which will uh, again be an opportunity to look at the particular needs of remote and rural uh, Scotland. However, I will ask my office to get in touch with uh, Richard Lockhead to perhaps get more details on the issues that are of concern uh, to him uh, within the, the Murray area, and I'd be happy to respond to him on that basis. Question number nine, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what improvements it considers necessary to the provision of abortion in Scotland. Minister Aileen Campbell. NHS boards are responsible for the provision of abortion services in Scotland. The Scottish Government recognises there are opportunities to improve this provision, which is why we funded research by Glasgow University on issues surrounding women requiring abortion later in pregnancy and women who have more than one abortion. 
Both of these pieces of research are now published and will be informing how NHS boards deliver abortion services. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Uh, thank the Minister very much for the answer. The 1967 Abortion Act allows abortion up to the time limit of 24 weeks. Uh, but as the, as the Minister is no doubt aware, research has shown that in practice, unofficial time limits are operating in Scotland, which range from 15 to 20 weeks, uh, leaving women in Scotland in many circumstances having to travel elsewhere, including the, the time and the money that it takes to do so, uh, and the, the unnecessary stress that's added to their experience uh, in order to uh, access abortion. Why? are women in Scotland facing those unacceptable barriers to exercising their reproductive rights? Minister. Um, I thank uh, Patrick Harvey for raising this incredibly important issue. I know that we did have a, a meeting planned and we do have one in the future to discuss wider issues that he raised at First Minister's questions. Um, the, there are uh, one reason uh, for some uh, NHS boards offering other um, time limits or local limits uh, to abortion is often around delivering a sustainable and safe service for a very small number of patients requiring that specialised procedure. Uh, also, women do travel from Scotland to England for later um, um, abortions if that is required. Uh, costs for that are met by NHS boards in Scotland. Um, I'm happy to look more fully at this issue and to engage with Patrick Harvey when we are scheduled to meet up as well and to also in, in any, uh, any other member who is interested to, to look uh, to engage with them as well. But there are issues around uh, sustainability and the safety of that service for women, which is one of the reasons why um, sometimes NHS boards offer um, different time limits. But there are relationships with other NHS boards and partnership uh, relationships with NHS boards to ensure that women do have access but certainly around the travel and the distance that some women have to uh, embark upon to access this uh, right that they have um, we are also looking at that issue as well because we understand the points that Patrick Harvey makes and, and raises. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, statistics show that abortion rates are higher among women living in the more deprived areas. What will the Scottish Government do to ensure all women have equal access to contraception and sexual health advice? Minister. Well, that's one of the reasons why we asked uh, Glasgow University to look at some of the uh, issues around abortion, including why women have more than one uh, abortion. Uh, we also ensure that women do have access to adequate uh, sexual health um, advice and support uh, should, should they need it. Uh, and, um, Again, you know, one of these issues around public health is that sometimes our most deprived communities do suffer the greatest, and that's something that we need to uh, tackle. And again, you know, happy to engage with um, Brian Whittle on this issue. But these are issues that we are certainly making progress on. We have uh, certainly commissioned research from uh, Glasgow University to look at some of the elements of this. But if he has issues that he thinks um, require further uh, look, I'm happy to engage with him on this issue because it's important that we get it right and we act to prevent issues before having a woman to uh, lead in, uh, having a woman take that very uh, difficult decision to have an abortion should they require. Question number 10, June McAlpine. Thank you, Providing Officer. Uh, can I ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the reported sharp rise in social care charges for disabled people under 65 in Dumfries and Galloway, and whether it considers this as a consequence of COSLA recommending an applicable income allowance of £132 per week? Cabinet Secretary. I'm disappointed that Dumfries and Galloway Council have chosen to adopt a lower income threshold for people under the age of 65. However, the Scottish Government funding has ensured that the threshold at which they begin to be charged for their social care has not been lowered further still in Dumfries and Galloway. The additional funding of £6 million that we provided to local authorities as part of the £250 million additional funding for social care in 2016-17 was intended to enable all local authorities to increase their charging thresholds to a minimum of 25% in order to take those on the lowest incomes out of social care charges altogether and reduce social care charges for many more service users. John McAlpine. Thank you very much uh, for that answer. Um, although several local authorities don't begin charging until well above the COSLA minimum, only Dumfries and Galloway Labour Control Council has chosen to immediately and dramatically reduce the threshold for care charges for existing service users and increase the rate of which they pay, despite the money that they've been given by the Scottish Government to reduce charges. 
This has resulted in vulnerable people with severe disabilities facing charge increases of 500% and bills of £70 a week. Does this, this comes from their already pressured benefits. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this is cruel and unjustified? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, uh, as I said earlier, I am disappointed that Dumfries and Galloway have chosen to reduce the threshold for social care charges. The, the COSLA charging guidance gives the threshold as a minimum, not a maximum, and other local authorities do have higher thresholds. We did provide additional funding to local authorities in 2016-17 to tackle poverty, and if those people on the lowest incomes are worse off now than they were as a result of these changes to the charging thresholds in Dumfries and Galloway, then that does fly in the face of the Council being provided provided with extra money to reduce charges. So I would hope that Dumfries and Galloway Council will seriously consider the representations made locally and in this chamber on this issue. Thank you, Mr. That concludes topical questions.